All right. Okay, I can. Oh, oh, send me over. Yeah, pick up the mic. Uh, okay, hello. Um, welcome to the last seminar of uh, this academic year. Yay! Yay. Uh, <laughs> happy to have uh, Annabelle Be uh, Benchman. Um, she comes down from the University of Washington, uh, where she's a postdoc working with Kelly Harris, has been for a few years, but you know, um, invited her because she's done all sorts of really great, interesting things in sort of the world of pop gen applications. She'll talk about some of those things, including uh, you know, stuff that uh, she's working on currently, um, as well as things from the PhD at uh, UCLA with Kurt Lohmuller and uh, Bob Lane. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks so much. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me OK? Awesome. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here. I've been having great conversations with people yesterday and today. I'm looking forward to talking with some of you after the seminar. Um, to give you a bit of a roadmap today, I'm just going to do a really brief introduction about sort of why I'm interested in non-model organism genomics and what I hope to learn. And then I'll take you through two sort of vignettes from my research. Um, the first, based on work I did in my PhD on the genomic history of the sea otter. This is all published work, so I'll keep it pretty sort of high level and give you some highlights of cool results we found. And then I'll dig in um, a little more in the second vignette onto my current work uh, as a postdoc, which is looking at the evolution of mutagenesis across mammal species. Um, and so there I'll dig in a bit more and tell you more about sort of our, our approaches that we're trying. Um, so yeah, and then feel free to ask questions as I go, and I'll have a break for questions midway through as well if, if something's on your mind. So why do we care about non-model organism genomics? Um, most genomic insights have been driven by these amazing model organisms, things with short lifespans that you can keep in a lab, you can breed in all sorts of interesting ways and do fascinating interventions into them, and this is where we've learned so much about gene function and population genetics and evolution. But as the cost of genome sequencing drops, we can increasingly apply these genomic techniques derived from model organisms to non-model organisms. And you may have just seen some press coverage about this um, amazing Xenomia consortium. I'm not actually involved in it, but it, they sequenced over 200 mammal genomes from across the mammal tree of life. And they're looking at you know, species that you could never bring into a lab. They might be highly endangered or gigantic like a whale. And you can still gain a lot of really interesting insights from these sort of more bizarre branches of the evolutionary tree that might have um, some really exciting things to tell us. So I kind of think of sort of three major goals of non-model organism genomics. The first being at the species level itself, where we might actually want to understand and a particular species evolutionary history, its population history. We might want to use uh, genomics to gain insight into what we can do to conserve an endangered species. And this will sort of be the themes I'll tell you about in my sea otter work. These next two bubbles sort of are a bit more expansive where we actually want to use non-model organism genomes to learn more about the evolutionary process itself and actually dig a bit more into the plumbing of evolution and find out not just about a particular species or clade, but how these processes might apply across a tree. And then ultimately, um, humans are kind of selfish and often we want to know what does this tell me about myself? What does this tell me about human evolution or even human health? And there can actually be insights brought back from non-model organism genomics into uh, the human health and evolution realm. So without further ado, let's dig into these uh, research vignettes. We're gonna start here with the sea otter genomic history. So sea otters evolved recently and rapidly in the North Pacific. When I say recently, I mean compared to other marine mammal species. So some of the earliest marine mammals are the manatees and dugongs. Those are about 55 million years ago when they entered the marine realm. Uh, cetaceans, so your whales, your dolphins, about 50 million years ago. Uh, pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, uh, walruses, about 30 million years ago. And so compared to these, sea otters are pretty recent. They only started diverging from their terrestrial relatives, something like the ancestor of a ferret, about 14 million years ago. And they only entered the oceans less than five million years ago, perhaps as recently as about a million years ago. So they're really the new kids on the block when you think about being a marine mammal, and yet they're able to survive in this really harsh environment. So is anyone a scuba diver? Yeah, okay. So you might know some of the things that you need to survive underwater, right? You need to be able to bring some extra air with you so you can stay down for longer. You need some form of propulsion, fins or paddles or some way to get through the water. 
you need some kind of ballast for your buoyancy control because you're bringing all this extra air and you don't want to bob to the surface like a cork. And then perhaps most importantly, especially in the Northwest, you need some form of temperature installation or you're not going to last down there very long. Sea otters don't have to stop at their local dive locker. Uh, they actually have evolved all of these traits pretty rapidly. They have expanded lungs that let them bring down extra air on their dives. They have a paddle-like feet and tail that propel them efficiently through the water. And they have really dense limb bones that actually act like a diver's weight belt that lets them uh, sink down deep in the water in spite of that extra air in their lungs. It acts as this buoyancy control. Perhaps most remarkably for sea otters is their form of temperature insulation. They have dense water resistant fur made up of interlocking hairs. It's the densest of any mammals by a lot. And they don't have a blubber layer. So if we think about all those other marine mammals I was showing you, those whales, those seals, they all have that nice layer of fat to keep them warm in the ocean. Sea otters don't have that. They rely entirely on this fur. Unfortunately for sea otters, this incredible adaptation also nearly led to their extinction at the hands of the fur trade. Humans noticed how good these pelts were at keeping people warm and repelling water. And so this sparked a mad fur rush in the 1700s through 1911, in which sea otters, which used to be highly abundant everywhere you see these hatched lines, all the way from the north of Japan down to Mexico, were hunted virtually to extinction in an extremely brief time period. They were driven fully extinct in Washington and Oregon, as well as British Columbia. Mexico and other parts of the range. A few sea otters managed to cling on. There were remnant colonies of fewer than 100 animals in each of these blue locations that managed to cling to existence and have actually, since their protection, started to rebound in a major conservation success. And so we really are curious as to what lasting impact this extreme population bottleneck may have had. So why are we interested in sea otter genomics? Well, as I mentioned, it's a remarkably recent evolutionary transition to the marine realm. So we're interested if we could detect any sort of signals of positive selection or gene loss um, associated with that transition. It's also kind of a remarkably natural population genetics experiment because you have all of these parallel bottlenecks occurring in all these independent sea otter populations around the whole range simultaneously, where you know they drop down from tens of thousands of otters to fewer than 100, and we wondered what sort of legacy that might leave that we could perhaps detect today. And finally, the future of sea otters is actually critical for nearshore kelp forest ecosystems. Um, sea otters are a keystone species, and their presence is essential for a healthy functioning kelp forest. And so we wanted to understand if any sort of genetic legacies from the fur trade bottleneck could um, endanger them in the future and potentially harm their future recovery. So I started by sequencing, assembling, and annotating the first sea otter genome. Um, this was back before long reads were uh, really available, so it was really good at its time. Now there's like, you know, more fabulous assemblies that could be done. Um, but we annotated it based on sea otter transcriptome data and carnivore protein data. At the same time, the Broad Institute was sequencing a giant otter genome. This is a freshwater otter species from South America. Sea otters and giant otters diverged about 10 million years ago. And it's a really nice point of comparison because they still have really interesting aquatic adaptations, but they don't live in the super harsh marine environment that sea otters live in. And they haven't experienced that extreme and sudden population decline that sea otters went through. And so they were a really useful sort of sister taxa for us to look at. Um, one of the best ways to sort of find what makes a particular evolutionary branch unique is by comparing it to all its relatives. So we had genomes from a bunch of other mammals that had been previously published, and so we could use comparisons between our otter genomes and these pre-existing mammal genomes to gain some insights into patterns of uh, positive selection and gene loss. I'm going to show you just a couple of our, our cool results. These are all uh, published in a paper in Molecular Biology and Evolution that uh, you can feel free to check out. Um, so one thing we did was look for signals of strong positive selection across uh, genes that we could align across these 13 mammal species. One thing we found is that people should be really cautious interpreting these strong signals of selection. We did a lot of visual inspection and curating of these results, and something like 80% of them were false positives. It was really grim. Um, but the ones that sort of made it through and seemed really sort of valid and interesting told us some interesting stories. And two of these genes in particular seemed really interest, uh, excuse me, interesting to us. They're related in humans 
in mice to limb density, cortical thickening, and bone mineralization. And I had mentioned to you that sea otters have these ballast-like dense limb bones. You can see a cross-section here of a femur between a ferret, a giant otter, and a sea otter. The sea otters is shorter, denser, more fully mineralized inside with thick cortical layer. And we think it's possible that changes in these genes may be under positive selection to drive this density in sea otter bones. We also found a sort of intriguing signal of weak polygenic selection spread across genes related to hair follicle development and density. This is a method called polycell uh, that Josephine Daub and colleagues developed, where you aren't looking for those single big outlier genes in your selection scan. You're instead looking at a gene set related to a particular perhaps gene ontology function and seeing if that set seems to be enriched for low level uh, changes and sort of weak positive selection. And so we found this sort of putatively interesting signal that it seems like a lot of genes related to hair follicle development seem to have sort of mild signals of positive selection. None of them are a big screaming outlier, but together they seem, um, based on a permutation test, significantly enriched for selection. And these genes in mice are related to things like uh, sparseness or patchiness of hair, whether hair mats or not, and the orientation of hair follicles. So it's sort of intriguing to think that perhaps this uh, amazing hair of otters is actually a polygenic trait affected by small changes across many genes. But what we really wanted to dig into from uh, sort of a population genetic standpoint is whether we can detect the impact of the fur trade, this extreme event that bottlenecked all these sea otter populations simultaneously. And to dig into this, we needed more sea otter genomes. One was not going to cut it. So we gathered over 100 sea otter samples from across the surviving remnant colonies, all the way from the Kuril Islands in Japan to California. We even got a couple from Mexico. And we were able to then uh, use these for the population genetic analyses we were interested in. Instead of resequencing every single one of these genomes in its entirety, we used a uh, technique called sequence capture where we could, based on our annotation of the sea otter genome, pick regions of the genome we were interested in and choose just to sequence those. So sequence a subset of the genome, which means you can sequence a lot more individuals more cheaply. And so we could reduce this 3 billion base pair genome down to about 50 million base pairs that we were interested in. And I was aided in this work by an amazing undergrad who now has her own PhD, Amber DeVries. So we captured coding regions, uh, putative regulatory regions, and most useful for the sort of demographic inference we wanted to do, we tried to find putatively neut neutral regions, not subject to strong selection that are really far away from genes, because that could give us our best snapshot of what's going on in the demographic history of the sea otter. These analyses enabled a huge, uh, excuse me, these data enabled a huge amount of analyses. Uh, we just made the cover of Molecular Ecology, so I urge you to, to check this out if you wanna dig into it more. I'm just gonna take you through a couple results today, but we had some ancient DNA, we had some really interesting recolonization patterns and stuff, so definitely check it out. Um, one thing that was really interesting was looking at population structure. So these are different sea otter remnant colonies, and we found using many different sort of structure analyses that they all are very uh, genetically distinct and cluster quite separately um, in a way that really reflects the geography of the region. You can actually kind of overlay a map of uh, the sort of northern Pacific Rim, and it actually matches up really nicely as to where these various islands are. But we did also find some really intriguing signals of sort of an admixture history on sea otters on a particular island in Kodiak in Alaska and sort of past sort of gene flow likely moving in both directions uh, along these island chains uh, in the deeper history of sea otters before the fur trade, which is really exciting. We then wanted to directly try to measure the impacts of the fur trade on our current sea otters. And so we used the site frequency spectrum, which you may have heard about in, in previous talks uh, from Peter and Andy's labs, this is the distribution of allele frequencies in a sample. And the shape of this distribution that kind of looks like cell phone bars is actually strongly affected by changes in population size or gene flow and other uh, factors. And so you can use this to try to infer population history using methods like DADI or FASIMCOL. And I did this with another fantastic undergrad, Pune Kalori, now getting their master's at SFSU. So we generated the neutral site frequency spectrum for each of our sea otter populations, and then did uh, a series of demographic uh, modeling work to try to determine what the best fitting demographic model was for each of these populations. They were pretty similar across all the populations. This is sort of a generic uh, model that's uh, the actual numbers might be a little different for each population, but it's pretty similar for all of them, which is in the sort of deeper past, we infer a 
pretty low effective population size. And this alone can actually drive a low heterozygosity across the genome. We had seen in the, the sea otter genome that they have pretty low diversity and didn't know if that was due to the fur trade or due to more ancient history. And it seems like that's maybe been a feature of sea otters for a while. But then we also inferred a severe population contraction where over 90% of individuals were lost. And um, the sort of magnitude and timing of this event seems concordant with what we know happened during the fur trade. And the fact that we pick it up, the signal in every single population we looked at um, gave us a bit more confidence that we were actually detecting that recent uh, bottleneck due to the fur trade. So this is showing just a collapse from this ancestral size at the top of the L down to a sort of current effective size in each population that's something like two to 13% of the original population size. We picked up maybe something like a bit of recovery in these pink commander islands, but we're not super confident about that. Those samples were pretty old and degraded, and so we're not sure if this was just a data artifact. We're more confident in the, the bottleneck models in the other populations. So we were wondering what this might mean for sea otters going forward, and so we did a ton of simulation work. Uh, Pune and I did um, a lot of slim simulations, and we also teamed up with Chris Kiraziz at UCLA to do more ecologically informed simulations um, to try to understand what this might mean for sea otter fitness going forward. And there's huge amounts of details in the, the paper and the supplement, but the sort of short answer is that we think that the genetic load, the burden of harmful variation did indeed go up for sea otters due to this fur trade bottleneck that they're less fit now than they were before. However, really interesting simulations that Chris did using uh, sort of more ecological parameters indicates that even though they might have this higher genetic load, it doesn't seem like it's so extreme that it'll cause them to sort of enter an extinction vortex and become really inbred and die out. And so that's sort of a hopeful note that they may be less fit than they used to be, but hopefully their future will be, you know, okay, they can make it from a genetic standpoint. They still could get eaten by orcas or messed up by an oil spill. We have to stay vigilant, but at least from a genetic standpoint, they might be all right. So just to recap uh, this stuff here, I talked to you about aquatic adaptation of sea otters, these sort of interesting signals of changes to different genes that we detected. And then we sort of really dug into their population genetics, the population structure and population history, particularly trying to detect this extreme signal of the fur trade and the damage it did to sea otter populations globally. Um, and as I mentioned, these are all uh, published in a couple of papers. So if you wanna dig into the, the details some more, check those out. We then applied these methods to other endangered marine mammals. Um, so with my colleagues Sergio Nicana Morales and Meishi Lin, uh, we looked at the demographic history of fin whales, which were greatly impacted by whaling. And then we also looked at the most endangered marine mammal in the world, the vaquita porpoise. Uh, there's only about 10 of them left. Um, and we tried to sort of understand whether they're doomed from sort of a genomic standpoint going forward due to low genetic diversity. And the results at least are somewhat hopeful that if they could stop being caught in nets as bycatch, they actually could maybe make it. Um, so I'm going to pause here for questions on this part of the talk um, and, and yeah, see where we go from there. Yes, please. Great question. I'll repeat for Zoom. Um, so I was asked what samples were collected from sea otters, like what specifically we collected. So I sadly did not get to go out much in the field. Many of these samples are from existing collections dating back to sort of the 80s and 90s. And typically what happened is people do surveys in these areas and they will um, tag sea otters. And when they tag them, it's kind of like a, a hole punch uh, to put a tag in the flipper but that makes a nice little tissue plug that then gets frozen. Um, some samples, we had blood. Um, I think some were from stranded sea otters, so there might be a necropsy, so there might be some liver or something else. Um, but yeah, great question. But I sadly did not get to collect most of them myself. <laughs> uh, yes, please. I have a question more about the behavior of uh, the other. How do they reproduce? Like they're birding or not doing this? Or what are the types of Great question. So the question was about uh, sea otter reproductive behavior and whether they're monogamous. Um, so let me see. One thing that's sort of interesting about sea otters is their dispersal is very sex biased. Uh, so females tend to have a very constrained home range and then the males sort of disperse more widely. There typically is one male who kind of dominates reproduction a bit in an area. It's not quite as extreme as sort of the harems of elephant seals, but there are males that are much more successful, and then many males who are sort of roving and, and not very successful. They don't form like strong 
monogamous pair bonds. They might maybe bond for a season uh, or not, <laughs> depending. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing that we think about a lot and we think this might contribute a bit to that low genetic diversity even prior to the fur trade of the fact that they have these small structured populations with very sort of biased sex ratios of who's reproducing you could also like add to that low diversity. Yes, please. Great question. Yeah, so one thing we found is that sea otters in California are really deeply diverged from any other sea otters. Um, and they also have some of the lowest diversity and are recovering a bit the slowest. So to me, that made it seem like a big priority if we want to maintain that lineage that's, you know, 20 to 30,000 years diverged from any other sea otter population. And as I showed you on that map, right, like the sea otters in Mexico were driven extinct and the sea otters in Washington and Oregon were driven extinct. So there's a sort of whole patch of the West Coast of the US where California's all that's left. So that to me makes it a big priority. Um, the story of the California Sears is really sad. They thought they were actually driven fully extinct and they found 30 in Big Sur when they were building that famous Bixby Bridge. Some of you may even have taken a road trip through there. They found 30 that had made it and all the ones alive today are descended from that 30. Um, I think the others, you know, there are some we found who have pretty high diversity and they're also you know, recovering, I mean, they all have low diversity, let me say, but higher than California. Um, they seem to be recovering okay. Um, and I think the other, the big question in sea otter conservation right now is should we be doing translocations that like mix populations together? And we did simulations that said that that would certainly rapidly decrease the genetic load that they gained through the fur trade. So if you took sea otters from one area and mixed them with sea otters from another, and if they actually successfully interbred, you might be able to bring that load down. All right, maybe one more question, then we'll move on, but then happy to take more at the end as well. Or we're good. All right, thank you all. These were great questions. So I want to loop back here to our sort of big goals. So I've been telling you more about a very species specific story with the sea otter, and now we're going to move on to these other bubbles and think more about these deeper evolutionary questions. So now let's talk about evolution of mutagenesis across mammals. So DNA mutations are really the substrate of evolution, right? Everything I was doing in that sea otter work relied on looking at mutations. And I started to get interested in my postdoc of, let me actually think about the process of how these DNA mutations came to be, which is something we often don't think about in pop gen, a mutation's a mutation and we move on. Um, but we wouldn't have made it far past being single celled organisms if we didn't have mutations. But on the other hand, mutations can also lead to really debilitating genetic diseases. They can lead to cancer, they can lead to aging. And so it's really important also for human health to understand where these come from. So there are two main sources of DNA mutations. Some occur during DNA replication. When the genome is copied, when a cell is going to divide, there can be errors that occur. Many of these get repaired. Some of them don't and may become mutations. Another source of mutation is DNA damage. The DNA is not in the process of being replicated, but it's getting bombarded by something like UV or a reaction, reactive oxygen species that in some way breaks it and it doesn't get properly repaired or it gets misrepaired. And that can lead to a mutation downstream. Even as far back as the 1930s, when we didn't know the structure of DNA yet, Alfred Sturtevant at Caltech noted that differences in mutation rate could be characteristic of whole species, meaning that different species could in fact have different mutation rates and different mutational processes. And this is really the motivating question behind my postdoctoral research, is trying to understand DNA mutation itself as an evolving trait and whether mutational processes could differ across species, particularly species that have wildly different life history traits, such as large baleen whales or tiny wild mice. So what are these forces that might actually change how mutations occur and lead to species having sort of different patterns of mutation or mutation rates? So one option, one hypothesis is that there are actually genetically encoded differences in the mutational process between individuals or between species, meaning that perhaps there's actually a difference in a particular DNA polymerase that affects its efficacy, and that's actually, it behaves a bit differently in a whale and a mouse. Another leading hypothesis is that reproductive aging is really important uh, for shaping mutational processes. We know in humans, 
that older parents pass on more mutations to their offspring. And so uh, many researchers think that differences in generation time between species could be one of the biggest reasons that they have differences in mutation rate or patterns of mutation. Because if you reproduce really young like a mouse or really old like a whale, um, that could actually drive differences. Finally, something that's quite a bit harder to quantify is sort of long-term environmental exposures. You can imagine species with different diets or different levels of exposure to UV or other things, perhaps also having environmentally driven differences in their mutations. So how can we even begin to start teasing these apart? Um, well, as I mentioned, typically in PopGen, we treat most mutations as mutations, um, but there's actually another way to go. Here I'm showing a stretch of DNA where we have uh, an A mutating to a G, a C mutating to a T, and an A mutating to a C. Instead of lumping these all together and just calling them mutations, we can actually pay attention to what mutation is specifically happening and actually quantify the relative sort of rates of these different types of mutations in a sample from a particular tissue or from an individual or from a whole population or an entire species. And we can actually learn a lot from this mutation spectrum, this relative uh, sort of uh, ratios or proportions of these different types of mutations. We can even go farther. Instead of just looking at this singular mutation type, this what we call the one mer type of a C to an A versus a C to a T, we can start to look at the flanking sequence around the mutating base, the base pairs on either side of it. So here I'm showing you two C to A mutations, but they have different flanking sequence, a TCT and an ACA, both of which are mutating C to A. When we look at what we call the three mer or triplet mutation spectrum, where we expand those mutation types out to be 96 types, all uh, noted by this different sort of flanking sequence on either side of the mutating base, we can start to see really interesting patterns uh, emerge. This is what we call a mutation signature that's been uh, associated in cancer biology with a, def a defect in polymerase delta proofreading of DNA. And what you might notice about this is that this causes a big spike in these TCT to TAT mutations, but it does not cause a spike in increased ACA to AAA mutations. So if we had just lumped these together and called these both C to A mutations, we would have totally missed this fascinating signal that could actually be potentially diagnostic of if you see mutations in this pattern occurring in a cancer, you might say, oh, I think there's a defective polymerase delta. Um, and so this is just an example um, from cancer biology of how this mutation spectrum can start to help you get at these actual etiologies driving mutations. So there's a range of data that you can do this sort of mutation spectrum analysis to. I was just showing you results derived from somatic mutations, so from cancer biology uh, happening in the soma. But you can also study germline mutations using these approaches. So one way to do this, if you want to look at mutations that are directly passed from one generation to the next, is to look at de novo mutations by sequencing trios. So you can sequence the genome of mother, of father, and offspring. And you can look at what mutations are new in the offspring that weren't in the parents and are basically passed on due to accumulated uh, DNA mutations throughout the parents' lifetime that they passed on to their children. These can give you really valuable insights into the mutation rate from one generation to the next, but these data are typically too sparse to look at that expanded 96 type spectrum that I was showing you. You're really stuck to that one more spectrum. Germline polymorphisms are the type of data I'm mostly going to be talking about today. These are sort of SNPs circulating in populations that are relics of past mutations. Somewhere back in the history of this population, a mutation occurred, and now it's at some intermediate frequency uh, in the individuals alive today, but it started as a mutation. Um, these are highly abundant, so they can actually give us resolution on that 96 type mutation spectrum and actually even higher dimensional spectra. You can go up to five MERS or seven MERS. Um, we're getting thousands of mutation types and you can actually still be able to fill in that spectrum. And they're available for many non-model organisms. It's hard, but is becoming increasingly available to get TRIO data from you know, weird animals on the evolutionary tree. Um, but many people have done interesting population genetic studies or SNP studies on non-model organisms. Germline polymorphisms do have downsides. Um, they might have been subject to selection or biased gene conversion in the past. You need to try to figure out ways to account for that. And they also occurred at different time points in the past. So they can't give you that really nice snapshot of a mutation rate occurring from one generation to the next, but they can give you a general sense of patterns of abundance of different mutation types um, sort of averaged over time. So my PI at UW, Kelly Harris, uh, 
discovered that the germline mutation spectrum of humans evolves very rapidly. This is a principal component plot um, where each point represents an individual's three-mer mutation spectrum, the relative abundances of those different 96 types. And what you can see is that human individuals cluster by their continental ancestry really clearly based on these spectra alone. And this is interesting because human populations did not diverge that long ago, yet in that very recent time, something is different enough about their mutational processes that we can distinguish them this clearly just based on the relative abundance of these different mutational motifs. And so Kelly and I wondered what this phenotype might look like over longer evolutionary timescales, not thinking about uh, population divergence, but actually about species divergence. So I generated germline mutation spectra from 13 mammal species polymorphism data. This was a somewhat opportunistic data set because we wanted high coverage, high quality sequencing data from at least five individuals. Um, and that can be a bit limiting. But the nice part about the data set we put together is it does span over 100 million years of mammalian evolution. And we do have an interesting range of sort of body sizes and other life history traits. So we could start digging in to some of these hypotheses. And so here's a phylogenetic tree of the species we have. The branch lengths here are scaled as sort of expected substitution rates. You get that, that long branch uh, for the mice, but we are spanning a sort of decent amount of, of evolutionary history. It's never easy to combine data sets uh, generated by other groups. And so we did a lot of sort of bioinformatics to try to um, merge these data sets in, in efficient ways. So for each species, we start with their polymorphism data. We have to determine the ancestral state of each SNP. We then wanted to mask regions of the genome where we thought genotype calls um, might be less reliable or might be subject to really strong selection. So we masked repetitive regions, low complexity regions, coding regions, and CPG islands from each species genome. And then we could estimate the abundances of these different one mer mutation types, three mer mutation types. We actually went all the way out to five mers and seven mers because we had enough data. We then needed to do a few more corrections. These data sets all had different sample sizes. And so we first downsampled them to five individuals each so that that could be sort of more of an apples to apples comparison. We also didn't want differences in mutation spectra to be due to underlying differences in genomic content. And so we actually uh, corrected our uh, mutation spectrum counts for each species to, uh, to act as though they all had the same genomic content um, so that we would not be confounding. Finally, we had really high diversity species like mice and super low diversity species like that vaquita porpoise, and we didn't want to have greater resolution on our estimates of the spectra from the mice than from the low diversity vaquita where it might be a bit noisier. So we actually downsampled all our species SNPs down to that same number of SNPs that the vaquita has, so at least we have sort of have similar levels of noise in each data set. We had one more thing we had to contend with, which is the fact that mutation spectra are in fact a compositional uh, type of data. This means that um, the you know, frequency, the proportion of one of these types uh, is sort of dependent on all of them. If you sort of made C to T's more abundant, something else would have to become less abundant. And typically people treat mutation spectra as though they aren't compositional and they do PCA on them or calculate Euclidean distances between them in ways that aren't actually appropriate for this type of data. Um, so Kelly and I dug into the work of Aitchison, who suggested various transformations to data so that you could actually work with compositional data uh, appropriately without spurious correlations or patterns uh, developing. And so we tried some different transformations and everything I'll be showing you has been through this centered log ratio transformation uh, to deal with the compositional nature of the data. So the first thing we really wanted to look at is whether it seemed as though our spectra were evolving over our mammalian phylogeny. So we did this first just visually using a PCA. So this is really similar to that PCA I showed you from humans. Here, each point is an individual's three-mer mutation spectrum, but this has all our species, not just those human populations. So the first thing you might notice is that individuals within a species tend to cluster together. The color is kind of clump. But then there are actually these kind of interesting broader cladistic groupings. So the mice are here. The great apes, including humans, are here. And then this clade that includes wolves, bears, and whales are kind of grouping together up here on PC2. This was particularly interesting to us because most of these are, again, from different studies by different groups. 
And so we wouldn't think that, you know, data on the brown bears, polar bears, fin whales, vaquita, and wolves, all generated from different groups at different time points, different sequencing strategies, would all cluster together due to some underlying batch effect. It seems sort of intriguing that they're all in the same phylogenetic clade here and are clustering together. So we wanted to try to actually formalize this sort of visual signal that we see. And we did this by trying to correlate mutation spectrum distance with phylogenetic distance on the tree. So we calculated what's known as the HSN distance between every pair of species mutation spectra. So here I'm just showing as an example, house, mouse, and gorilla. So we can get the HSN distance between their one MER spectra, those are those, those simple six mutation types, or between their three MER spectra, those are those 96 types where you get a bit more uh, power to see interesting um, patterns. And we then could correlate that with how far apart they are on the phylogenetic tree. So here's a cartoon of what we're looking for. So if on the x-axis we have phylogenetic distance, on the y-axis we have mutation spectrum distance, each point is going to represent a comparison between a pair of species, between the spectra of the house mouse or the Algerian mouse, or between the spectra of the fin whale and the house mouse. If there's what we call phylogenetic signal, we might see some nice uh, tight correlation between how far apart you are on that tree and how different your mutation spectra are. On the other hand, many people think mutation spectra are just affected by random forces or by noise, and so then we might see this sort of uncorrelated scatter that doesn't indicate that there's any real relationship between how distantly or closely related you are and how different your mutational patterns look. Uh, finally, because these points are not independent uh, to test for significance, we can actually do a linear regression. Um, there's a test for phylogenetic signal called the Mantel test. It's one of the few tests for phylogenetic signal that actually works on a multivariate trait like the mutation spectrum. Um, and basically what it does is you have your matrix of mutation spectrum distances between every pair of species and your matrix of phylogenetic dis uh, distances between every pair of species, and you permute one of those matrices 10 million times to get sort of a null distribution um, that indicates what uh, level of correlation you might expect by chance versus something that may actually have some interesting phylogenetic signal. And that's how we get our p-values. So I'm first going to show you now we're in real data, no longer cartoon world. These are the results from comparing the one MER spectra between all our pairs of species. And what we have here is a significant phylogenetic signal, uh, p-value 8 times 10 to the minus 6, uh, indicating that as you get more distant from each other on that phylogenetic tree, the distance between your mutation spectra goes up. The signal gets clearer when we look at that more powerful three-mer mutation spectrum. Uh, we get a, a really tight correlation here between mutation spectrum distance and phylogenetic distance, and our p-value is actually approaching the lowest p-value you can get for a Mantel test with 10 million per mutation, so it's a very robust signal. We were worried that there could be underlying technical artifacts perhaps driving this in some sort of batch effect way, so we looked at sort of three uh, technical artifacts that we thought could be sort of the most um, perhaps pernicious, uh, which would be uh, reference genome scaffold and contig 50 how contiguous the genome is of each of these species, as well as sequencing depth for each of these data sets. And we found that none of these had any significant correlations with mutation spectrum distances between species, which was reassuring. We also found that if we stratified the three-mer spectrum by central one-mer type, we still saw these significant correlations uh, between mutation spectrum distance and phylogenetic distance. This indicates that it's not just one or two one-mer types driving this pattern, which could be what would happen if bias gene conversion was perhaps uh, the driving force behind this. And that's so this seems more that it's actually spread across many different three-mers, that there are these small changes across all of these driving this pattern. There's a hypothesis from Michael Lynch that we think is sort of concordant with uh, our findings. Um, he hypothesized that there are these nearly neutral changes happening to the mutational processes over evolutionary time, where there's perhaps some small mechanistic change happening to, say, some DNA polymerase in the ancestor of these species that doesn't affect fitness so much that it gets eliminated, but may slightly impact the relative abundance of some of these different triplets, perhaps. You could imagine many of these changes happening over evolutionary time, all with very small sort of butterfly wing impacts that ultimately lead to species that are more closely related having more similar spectra and those that are more distantly related having more distant spectra. And we think if this is the case, it would be really intriguing and exciting because it would be sort of a novel aspect of genetic drift. We're used to thinking of you know, mutations accumulating along a phylogeny due to drift, 
but this is actually the mutational process itself potentially drifting across the phylogeny as well, which would be really exciting. So we then wanted to see whether any a priori mutation models could try to reconstruct um, the differences we see between our species spectra, because people have existing hypotheses over what might drive uh, mutational patterns, and we wanted to sort of road test those a bit. So I briefly mentioned mutation signatures before, so this is a quick reminder. These are characteristic patterns of different mutation types that can often be linked to particular mutational processes. So I showed you this one associated with defective polymerase delta before. Um, and you can actually leverage methods from cancer genomics to try to reconstruct your data um, as a linear combination of exposures to these, uh, sorry, I have a typo there, to these different mutation signatures. I like to think of this in a more fun way of trying to reconstruct a mystery cocktail. So let's say you went to a bar, you had an incredible drink, I'm pregnant right now, so for me it'd have to be a mocktail, but it's really awesome and you wanna go home and you wanna make it from scratch, but you don't know what was in it. You'd wanna try to mix together some set of liquors in some amounts to get as close as possible to the taste of this original cocktail that you had. And that's, in a nutshell, non-negative matrix factorization. What we start with as input is one of our is our set of species mutation spectra. So this is maybe from just species A. And this is the original cocktail we're trying to recreate. And then we have some set of signatures. These can either be inferred from the data or can be from an a priori model. And then you want to sort of infer what sort of dosage of each of these signatures you should mix together to get as close as possible to that original mutation spectrum. And typically in cancer genomics, these, uh, the input and the reconstruction are compared using a measure called cosine similarity. And if it's above sort of 0.95 or 0.99, you say, great, it's a match. We've successfully reconstructed uh, this spectrum. Kelly and I think a lot about sort of what actually counts as a good enough reconstruction of mutation spectrum. So there's this high cosine similarity metric, but we also argue that a good model should capture that phylogenetic signal we're seeing in our empirical data. And if a model fails to do so, perhaps it does not have sufficient complexity to capture everything that's going on in the sort of clade specific way that we're observing in our data. So you could imagine sort of a bad model that isn't reconstructing the phylogenetic signal that we see, or sort of a better model, come on, there we go, that does capture the phylogenetic signal that we see. And this, we thought of it as sort of an additional way to, to test these models beyond just cosine similarity. So, okay, let's see how well two a priori models perform. So the two models we wanted to test, one at the Freemur spectrum level is based on two cancer signatures, and I'll tell you more about them in a minute. And then I'll tell you about a model actually derived from human reproductive aging. But let's start with these cancer signatures. So these are signatures uh, that were initially found in somatic data uh, based by, by cancer researchers. They're called SBS1 and SBS5, but they've actually been found in the germline as well, and they've been found across many different species. These are very ubiquitous signatures. And we know what causes one of them. SBS1 is an enrichment of mutations at CPG sites. And uh, CPG to TPG mutations are, are caused by the deamination of methylated cytosine. We actually sort of know the, the mechanism behind that one. SBS5 is a little more mysterious. It's found all over the place in soma and germline across species. It accumulates in a clock-like way as we age in our tissues, but it has an unknown cause. People often talk about it in the literature as a background mutational process, perhaps. Um, but many people sort of argue in the literature that these two signatures are kind of sufficient to explain most mutations in sort of normal healthy tissue or a healthy germline. So are they sufficient to explain the patterns in our data? When we did the cocktail fitting uh, to our species, we found good cosine similarity by sort of the, the cancer genomics uh, metric. It's uh, over 0.95, that's a good match. Um, but we found that the exposures to each of those two signatures are fairly uniform across our species. So SBS5 in brown, SBS1 in pink, there's sort of little fluctuations, but in each of our species, it appears that each of them gets a very similar dosage of these two signatures. When we then look to see whether the reconstructions based on those very similar dosages could reconstruct our phylogenetic sig signal, it was a total fail. There's absolutely no phylogenetic signal in the spectra reconstructed using just those two signatures. And that tells us that these commonly found signatures are really not sufficient to explain everything going on in our data. They may be partially responsible for many of the mutations present, but they can't explain these interesting clade-specific patterns we see. And so we would need more complex models at the Threamer level to explain those patterns. 
we're now going to drop down from that more powerful three-mer mutation spectrum down to that one-mer mutation spectrum, because we want to look at reproductive aging signatures derived from human data. I mentioned to you that older parents pass on more mutations to their offspring. These are some data showing that from a family sequenced in Iceland by Jonsson and colleagues. Um, they looked at the age of the parent and how many mutations were passed on by that parent to their offspring. And you can see these uh, positive uh, correlations here, both for mothers and for fathers. It got more interesting when they dug into the one more mutation spectrum of uh, these mutations, not just that more mutations are occurring, but what types of mutations. For instance, in uh, aging parents, um, the fraction of C to G mutations that gets passed on stays really stable as fathers age. However, as mothers age, it sharply increases. So older mothers are passing on a much higher fraction of C to G mutations than younger mothers. And this has been uh, thought to be caused by double strand breaks in DNA in aging ova. So by digging into the mutation spectrum, you can actually start to separate out these two um, mutational processes of aging from the father's lineage and from the mother's lineage. And so some groups, including the Hahn and Sharp groups, have been actually trying to use these human reproductive aging signatures to predict mutational patterns in other species and across human populations through time. They've looked at owl monkeys, cats, Neanderthals. Um, and there have also been some really good pushback to this approach as well and sort of some interesting really debate going on in the literature. We thought, okay, hey, our data set's not perfect, but we've got a pretty good range of average age at first reproduction and of max reproductive lifespan across our species. Can we detect any sort of action of these human-like reproductive aging signatures in our data? And so we converted those regressions I was showing you into mutation signatures, uh, sort of representing each parent sort of aging mutational process. So in red, we have the maternal age signature. You can see there's that big spike in those C to G mutations. In blue is the paternal aging signature. And then the sort of Kraft Mac orange, we have what we call a young parent signature, indicating the sort of types of mutations you might inherit if both your parents were around puberty at the time of your conception and hadn't accumulated these sort of um, aging signature mutations yet. And so we did the same sort of uh, cocktail fitting approach. And we found uh, that we could reconstruct our species one mer spectra uh, to very high uh, cosine similarity. I should briefly mention the reason we're dropped down to that one mer spectrum is that we don't have any information about what reproductive aging does to the three mer spectrum. The data are just too sparse. We're restricted right now to just this, these six mutation types. But what was really interesting is the good cosine similarity was intriguing. It's a very good match to our data, but the exposure patterns were actually really interesting to us. The first thing we noticed is that the two mouse species were reconstructed 100% using the young parent signature, no influence of maternal or paternal aging. And that made a lot of biological sense to us, right? Mice reproduce early, they reproduce often, they do not put off reproduction until after grad school the way I did. Uh, we wouldn't really expect them to have a lot of mutation mutations due to parental aging. On the other hand, all our other species reproduce relatively later in life compared to mice, and all of them seem to so, show at least some impact of this paternal aging signature that we couldn't find anything of the maternal age signature. There was another kind of interesting outlier that intrigued us, which was the wolf. This one, after the mice, had sort of the largest dosage of this young parent signature and the smallest dosage of the pater uh, paternal age signature. And that was interesting to us because after mice, Wolves are the next youngest reproducer in our data set. You know, mice reproduce at maybe 11 weeks. Wolves are about a year, but all our other species are more like five years, 12 years, 20 years higher up. And so it's interesting to us that the sort of young reproducers in the data set seem to have the least influence of this paternal aging signature. It also intrigues us because we've been, we've been wondering why the comparisons between wolf and mouse in all of our sort of phylogenetic signal comparisons seemed on the low side for how distant they are on the tree. You can see these sort of two low outliers of our wolf comparisons and uh, wolf mouse comparisons, I should say. And that's sort of tantalizing that perhaps the similarity in their reproductive style of being young reproducers maybe is driving a bit of similarity at the spectrum level that is sort of that sort of belies their phylogenetic distance but we'd really need more young reproducing non rodents to sort of really drill into the signal but it's definitely tantalizing perhaps the most interesting thing about this reconstruction is that the mutation uh, aging mutation 
excuse me, aging signature reconstructions did capture the phylogenetic signal of our data. So in black is the empirical phylogenetic signal of our one more spectrum, and then in green are the reconstructions based on those aging signatures. And they actually do capture the same amount of phylogenetic signal as we saw in the empirical data. And that's really intriguing because it seems like at least at this very simple spectrum level, perhaps this model is actually a good contender for explaining differences between species spectra at the one more level. The residuals of the model were still pretty biased. There's improvements that could definitely be made, but um, I think this really can't be discounted as an important source of mutation spectrum variation. But just a reminder that we do think we need these more complex models to explain three more spectrum variation. We have no idea what reproductive aging does at the Threemer level, but just remember that we saw this much tighter phylogenetic signal and strong correlation uh, between mutation spectrum distance and phylogenetic distance at the Threemer level, and it seems unlikely that the sort of weaker signal we're seeing at one more level can explain everything at the Threemer level. And so we think sort of maybe there's a model, a nice complex model, that could actually involve both reproductive aging and perhaps genetically encoded differences that are drifting along the phylogeny that all sort of work together to shape differences between species mutation spectra. So to recap this part, so a characterized mutation spectra of 13 non-model organisms, uh, we found that these mutation spectrum differences accumulate over a phylogeny, which could be consistent with a drift-like accumulation of nearly neutral differences. And then we also found that human-like reproductive aging may be sort of occurring and affecting mutational patterns um, across other mammals as well. Finally, I just want to say this isn't just mammals. We looked at the mutation spectrum of everyone's least favorite organism, uh, COVID, SARS-CoV-2, and found that it actually shows a phylogenetic signal in its one more mutation spectrum as it's been evolving. And so it's possible that this is something that actually occurs in other systems as well. So to wrap up here, uh, we have looked at sort of species-specific insights from non-model organism genomes and then branched out into these sort of deeper evolutionary questions by comparing genomic data sets across species with hopefully some um, carryaways for, for our own uh, insights into ourselves as well. So with that, I really... I want to thank Peter so much for inviting me. This has been such an amazing visit. Georgia nominated me as a speaker, and I'm really grateful. I'm deeply grateful to Kelly Harris and the whole Harris Lab. They've given me so many insights and advice as I did these analyses. And finally, I want to thank the data providers and collectors. No one can get a data set of this many interesting mammals without a lot of work happening in the field, in the lab, and on the computer to make them happen. And I'm so grateful to have such great collaborators who share their data with me. And with that, I'll finish up and ask for any questions. Thank you. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. and have, like, more Great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to recap it for Zoom and tell me if I miss anything. So the really awesome question. The question was that, you know, wolves and mice also may have larger litters than some of the other species in the data set that maybe only have one or two offspring that they, you know, sort of nurture for a longer time. And could that sort of difference in litter size also be, be a driving force in the patterns we see? Well, it, during, during that time, gotcha. Okay, so yeah, really, really, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I think one thing I think about is, you know, we're sort of thinking about these mutations in the germline accumulating um, throughout the sort of lifetime of the parent, and there's sort of some amount they get before they reach puberty, and then once they hit puberty, it seems like that sort of DNA damage kind of may accelerate, and um, you get sort of this increase in the germline of both males and females, this increase in mutations that could be passed on. I'm not sure how being from a larger or smaller litter might affect that process, which is interesting to think about, but I could also imagine the litter size mattering in perhaps 
wolves and mice, and I don't know if this is the case, if anyone's a mouse biologist weigh in, they may have larger and healthier litters when they're younger and, and maybe even the other species too get more species, get more offspring out really early and then just die pretty soon after, and then they don't try to stretch it out. Whereas these ones who put a lot of parental investment in, maybe it is worth, you know, being a bit older, living longer, putting a lot into that one offspring and, you know, reproducing later. So sort of these different sort of R versus K selected species. Um, having these different evolutionary trade-offs, but I'm not sure. It's, I don't know. I, I don't think I've quite like got the answer to your question uh, offhand, but it's a really interesting one. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. It, sorry, say non-calibrated what? Phylog oh, yes. Um, so like uh, ultrametric versus non-ultrametric phylogenies. Great question. Yeah, let me repeat that for Zoom. So she was asking that I we did our test using um, a tree where the branch lengths were scaled based on expected substitutions rather than one um, scaled to time where uh, it is ultrametric and sort of all end, has the same endpoints. So we had that long branch in the mice. So we actually did it both ways, uh, which... I always, like to, I always like to test every possibility. And we saw the same significant phylogenetics with an ultrametric tree, but we were interested in sort of that long branch length in the mice in case that may have sort of actually um, led to them having even more opportunities, more generations for these mutators to maybe arise or impact things. And you do sort of see that the mice are sort of off on their own on PC1 um, in the PCA. And so we were sort of intrigued by, by that. Um, and it seems like maybe the, the non ultrametric tree fits sort of the mice stuff a little bit better, but both of them give this really robust phylogenetic signal. Great question. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Mm-hmm. At the one more level, yeah. At the one more So that's a great question. So let me repeat some of it back for Zoom and you can tell me if I left anything out. So Andy's great question is sort of, you know, of all the things that can co-vary with phylogeny, including say the environment, that it may not actually be like genetically encoded changes to say DNA repair genes, that it could just be environment co-varying with phylogeny that drives this and then the sort of second part of the question if i have it right is that you know if we see that this reproductive aging is sort of sufficient at the one more level do we need to invoke anything else um, to explain things right something that's extrinsic yeah i think that's a fantastic question that's still a very active question. Um, I would say a few things about that. One is that I do think reproductive aging is a very important factor, and there are some groups who do th think it is the only factor. Um, I also think the environment and genetically encoded mutators are important for a few reasons. One is we have found genetically encoded mutators. They do exist. Um, they've been found in mice. They've been found in yeast. Uh, they were recently found in a macaque. So we know that there are genetically encoded differences that can adjust the mutation spectrum. So that's one. It's like we know they're out there. I think it's quite possible there's more we haven't found that just have very low effect uh, sizes. The other aspect is that, you know, we're explaining things sort of at the one mer level, but then when we stratify that three mer spectrum by central one mer, we still see this really strong phylogenetic signal. And as far as we know, reproductive aging, I mean, all we know about it is what it does to one mers. It could well have triplet effects we don't know about, but it seems 
sort of perhaps that there's probably other things affecting those triplets, which could be intrinsic or extrinsic. And then finally, we do see, and I didn't present these data, we see sort of interesting clade specific enrichments of even longer motifs, like particular seven mer motifs or five mer motifs, say in the two whale lineages, the fin whale and the vaquita, that it's like an enrichment of one particular um, uh, seven mer. And the fin whale and vaquita were sampled from the same environment. They're both in the Gulf of California. The fin whale has a um, long reproductive lifespan. You know, they live to be like 80 years. They reproduce at age like 20. Uh, Vaquita starts reproducing at five and reproduces every year and has a short lifespan. And it, they had near identical enrichment of a particular motif. Is that just the environment? Probably not. Is that just, you know, so things like that sort of stick out to us as like, yes, reproductive aging, yes, environment, but something else that's like inherited genetically seems relevant. We were, if you have ideas for that, I would love to chat about that. For, for, for Zoom, he asked if we could regress the environment out. I think that'd be amazing. We did do some, we did a lot more sort of confounder tests than I was able to show today of different sort of biological confounders like genetic diversity, age of first reproduction, and some are associated with the mutation spectrum. Some are only associated with the mutation spectrum of certain types, um, but we didn't have a ton of environmental data there are just, again, sort of observational things, like if we think about environmental exposures, right, humans and chimps, very closely related, our environments are very different, you know, we're smoking, we're out doing all of these different things, and yet their spectra fall right where they should on that line. Polar bears, brown bears, very different environments, one hibernates, one doesn't, pretty, you know, their spectra are sort of appropriate, you know, and, and fin whale vaquita, like everything is sort of falling where it should on that line, and so it's, but I think, yeah, it'd be really cool to talk after the seminar about like if we could actually formally regress those effects out, especially if we could regress out the reproductive aging and like see what's left. Yeah, great question. Any other last things? I know I've kept you guys a while. <laughs> Maybe we should again. Yeah, we can chat after. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, tea time upstairs. Oh, you want? No.